Hello, and welcome back to another day of free-to-play in Magic the Gathering Arena. Get the dish on the latest with me, Lord Rumfish. This is part three of my toolbox deck building crafting guide. The idea here is that we're going to create a toolbox of cards. Using these, you should be able to go out and create different archetypes of decks. With that in mind, we're talking about white today. And I'm starting with commons and uncommons that caught my eye. Now, this is not to say that there are not many more cards that I have not sherry picked out here. That could be of use to you that you want to build around. If you know that you do and they're common or uncommon, go ahead and craft them. But I want to talk about these. Later we'll get to the rares and mythics. So, we're diving into white today. Lay Down Arms. This is a fantastic piece of new removal. You can use it in a two-color deck without too much trouble. The Dominaria United Common Dual Lands have two land types. Uh, if you happen to open or craft the rare uh, Tri-Lands that are from Streets of New Capenna, that have three basic land types. Then using those and using the common uh, tap lands, you could also pretty easily create a three color deck that can reliably lay down arms. Otherwise this would be for a mono white deck, but for a mono white deck this goes in all kinds of different strategies. It's good enough to run in an aggro deck, it's good enough to run in control, mid-range, so checks all the boxes. Uh, it's a great, great card. All right, Recruitment Officer. I have one here. I don't remember whether I got this in Jump In or through a pack opening. So if you are making an aggro deck, whether it is soldiers or not, the activated ability on this card does not care about soldiers. It finds any creature card with mana value three or less. So one copy of this card in any white aggro deck, I think is the right call. Because it digs you through the deck and helps you to continue to find more threats. And potentially answers, um, if your creatures uh, are attached to another effect. Now whether you want more than one is an open question, right? Having three of these on the board does not help you with the activated ability on this card. In that case, you're just adding more Savannah Lions, more 2-1s to the battlefield. Um, it's fine in multiples, and you might want uh, more than one copy of the effect in case the opponent removes the first one you play. So it's not a bad top deck in the late game. But, uh, strictly speaking, having more than one on the battlefield doesn't have any additional synergy. But I will say that one copy is well worth crafting. Ambitious Farmhand. So, this card, along with Spirited Companion, helps to give you early game blockers that also ramp you up to what you need. Um, this card and the Spirited Companion, they can both find a land for you. You're guaranteed to find a land with the Farmhand. In a control deck, that might be exactly what you want. Control decks usually want to hit all of their land drops, all the way up to about, I don't know, 8, 9, 10 mana or so. They usually keep drawing cards and they have ways to use all that mana. It's not terrible for mid-range or even aggro decks. The reason I'll tack on aggro decks here is uh, if you hit Coven, which is not too hard in an aggro deck, Right, this is one power, recruitment officer is two power, your three drop might have three power. At that point you can use the Coven ability, it turns into a 3-3 three, three lifelink, and a 3-3 three, three lifelinker is a very considerable threat and helps you to race with the opponent. You might not want four copies of this in an aggro deck. Um, it's mana intensive to flip it and you're not guaranteed to. But uh, the fact it's even in consideration for that means uh, this card is pretty flexible. You 
don't just have to use it in a mono white deck. Um, any any deck that can spare having a few planes in the mana base, uh, this will get you card advantage, help you hit your land drops. Overall, just great card. Good tool to have in the toolbox. Cathar Commando. So, lots of people are talking about uh, the new green card, Canker Bloom, uh, that came out in the new set. So, Cathar Commando is a very similar effect. It does not proliferate, but it has flash. So, as a three power creature for two with flash, uh, in an aggro deck, you can flash this in when your opponent thinks you don't have a great attack coming the next turn. So you can sneak through the three damage on this card. Later it can favorably trade with something in combat, possibly as a blocker. Or uh, there are so many targets in standard right now to destroy artifacts and enchantments. In a red deck, you've got Kimono Face's Kakazan. Uh, you also have Mechanized Warfare. Uh, some, some red deck lists might also run a Rabbit Battery. It's really not outrageous uh, to find a target in a red deck. White Soldiers, less likely. Um, you might find that they run the uh, one-drop artifact uh, that pumps up a creature when it attacks and has Unearth. They might, uh, in some lists, possibly be running um, Wedding Announcement. You're less likely to find a target going up against soldiers, but uh, it's not a completely dead ability. And just about every other list I could name to you in standard probably has various, um, you know, token and non-token artifacts and enchantments flying around everywhere. This card in this format is pretty great. It is well worth crafting four of them. So, Sanctify kind of in the same vein. Um, artifacts and enchantments are so common, you might want to go in for a copy or two of Sanctify. I'm going to say that at least having one copy might be a, a kind of a silver bullet that you want in a control list. Uh, even in a mid-range kind of list, the three life gain helps you uh, win a race with the opponent or in a control deck helps you stall for time. Uh, it's just overall a useful effect in this format, likely to find a target. So Sanctify is a good card. You might not want four copies though. I'm gonna say crafting at least one is good. Spirited Companion, like the Farmhand, comes down as an early blocker. Unlike the Farmhand, it cannot turn into a 3-3 life linker, but it can find you a card that's not a land. So Spirited Companion goes well into Enchantment Synergy decks. Um, that deck is still pretty effective in the format, if you want to build a green-white enchantment deck. Spirited Companion also just stands on its own for being a reasonable drop or a mid-range or, con or control strategy. I'd, I would not say aggro. It's not aggressive for enough for aggro, but any other deck that wants to stall and get to the mid-late game, this card's just fine. In this case, I have four copies. Maybe you do too. I don't remember exactly where I got it from. It could have been starter decks, could have been jump in, but if you don't have it, it's worth it. Union of the Third Path. So, this card can't win you the game, but... Uh, Decks like blue-white control, and I've seen it in other um, white multicolor control. This deck can, this card can help your deck to stave off imminent death from an aggro start. So you've got three mana open on turn three, the opponent uh, builds up their board like crazy, they're trying to uh, tempo you out of the game. Uh, they do this all in attack. You respond with Union of the Third Path, then calmly untap and play a Sweeper. It's sort of like you did a Fog Effect against their attack. Uh, because it draws a card and replaces itself, it's not entirely dead in other uh, matchups. Most of the time, 
life gain is reasonable for you against a control deck, including the uh, new ones with Jace that um, Covert Go Blue's been piloting. This might not be a great card for you, but in most matchups, having a couple copies of this in your control deck is probably fine. Uh, Mid-range probably doesn't want this so much, but it's a good enough deck in control that crafting one or two copies uh, should be on your radar. Warlord's Elite. I'm not going to tell you to craft this card, I just wanted to talk about it. So, um, in the new set, for Mirrodin uh, equipment makes a token and buffs it up. I just wanted to mention that if you are running a four Mirrodin equipment deck, uh, tapping the equipment has no effect on the abilities of the equipment. Right? Uh, this is a synergy I got into with uh, Restoration of Iganjo and uh, Citizen's Crowbar. It's the uh, it's another piece of equipment that makes a citizen token and equips to the a citizen token when it comes into place from Streets of Nukapenna. It's similar to Four Mirrodin in this regard. And with Restoration of Iganjo, you can discard it to the graveyard. It comes back tapped, but that doesn't matter because the token it creates is untapped. Similarly, Warlord's Elite can come down, tap all your equipment, right? Tap two equipments you control, and now you've got a 4-4 four, four for three. Just throwing that out there. A uh, little kernel of a deck building idea for you. Um, that's all I wanted to say about Warlord's Elite. You don't have to craft it. Gavany Dawnguard. All right, so one of the joys of an aggro deck is that it can be built on an extreme budget. There are plenty of other aggro deck cards that I have not mentioned here. Um, I just wanted to hit up um, cards that are so good or so versatile they could fit into aggro, like Recruitment Officer, Cathar Commando, maybe even one or two Ambitious Farmhand. Gavany Dawnguard is a soldier, notably. Three mana, three three, ward one. So, uh, if you've ever played against Rafine, you know that a three mana, uh, fairly tough creature with ward one can be hard to deal with. Unlike Rafine, this does not even die to a cut down. So the opponent has to use a real removal spell and they have to pay one extra. This starts the day-night cycle. Whenever day-night flips, you look at the top four, reveal a creature card with mana three or less, put it into your hand, the rest on the bottom. In that regard, it's like Recruitment Officer, except you did not pay any mana for the ability. And in multiples, unlike the Recruitment Officer, they all trigger when day-night flips. And then you don't spend any mana for the ability. Maybe people tried this when Soldiers first came out, and maybe there were just better cards. I think some of the three drops you have access to in Soldiers, like uh, the guy that puts plus one counters on things, and when your uh, non-token Soldiers die, he makes an Artifact Soldier. Or the 2-3 uh, Blue Flyer attacks and makes a Soldier, and you can tap three creatures to draw a card. Maybe it's three Soldiers. Anyway. Soldier deck, uh, like most white uh, aggro decks, it's really tight at the three drop spot. It's dense with different cards that are all good for it. But if you're on a budget, um, you want a, a cheap way using your uncommon wild cards to really threaten the opponent and keep getting card advantage in your aggressive aggro deck. This card is, I think, Quite good. I uh, I think of this one sort of like um, oh there's a there's a blue two three for four draws a card whenever day night flips. I think this card's even better for the right deck. If you have lots of three mana or less creatures, where you're almost guaranteed to hit a drop in uh, four cards, get a hit. I think this card could be even better than that card. It doesn't die to a cut down and it has ward and it comes down a turn sooner. 
Gavany Dawnguard, why aren't you playing it? All right, finally, we're going to talk about repair and recharge. This is an uncommon that brings an artifact enchantment or planeswalker from your graveyard to the battlefield. What people are mostly doing at the moment is returning uh, giant artifacts such as Portal to Phyrexia from the graveyard to the battlefield. If you watched part one of this crafting guide where we started at Colorless, then if you crafted those with me, you have good targets for this repair and recharge. You already have things that you would love to pull back from your graveyard to use this effect with. So with that in mind, why not use some uncommons here? To show you that I'm serious, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I've picked up some of these cards through uh, jump in, starter decks, and opening packs, but these other five uncommons and nine uncommons, I'm going to spend my wild cards. All right, on to the rares and mythics in white. So I am highlighting here what I think are some of the most versatile, very strongest contenders in the rare and mythic cards. Let's go over why. Fateful Absence is not just a cheap two mana removal spell that deals with any creature. In black they have to resort to Infernal Grasp uh, to do this at this mana cost, which loses two life and does not hit Planeswalkers. Fateful Absence gives the opponent a clue token. Um, some people hate that. They just hate it. Don't want to run this card because of it. Um, this is such fantastic creature removal, and there's a scant amount of really easy, accessible Planeswalker removal. Unless you're red. Uh, Fateful Absence is just kind of a great card. Um, helps out aggro, helps out midrange, helps out control, right? Kind of checks all the boxes, goes into monocolor, multicolor. If you craft one copy of this card, you will not be sad. In fact, if you craft four copies, you'll probably be content with it. On my other account, I use Fateful Absence a lot. Uh, it reminds me of a uh, card from the old Innistrad set. Um, was it something in stone? Where it exiles a creature and every other uh, creature that has the same name. And then uh, the opponent can get clues. So I don't think Fateful Absence is quite as good as that card, but I think it's very good. All right, White Sun's Twilight. This is a new sweeper. It's going to be legal and standard for a very long time, unlike some of the other sweepers that are going to rotate in the fall. Until you get to seven mana, this is not a sweeper. So it has some deck building considerations. You either want to get to seven mana in a hurry, so you can do a ramp control deck, which is fun. I have a green-white control deck. It's fun. Um, or you can take advantage of the fact that it's a gain X life, create X creatures card. And you could put it into a token strategy. You know, the kind of deck that wants... Um, oh, cards like a jet mirror. That sort of thing. You could also do a life gain deck. There's the um, the one drop uh, white creature gains a life whenever a creature enters the battlefield. That would cause you to gain twice X life when you cast White Sun's Twilight. And if you're taking advantage of the life gain triggers with the, uh, the two mana card, I can't remember the name of anything right now. There's a two mana uh, rare, two white, two two, Gets plus one counter whenever you gain life, and eventually gains flying, vigilance, and ultimately indestructible. So, White Sun's Twilight could be good in life gain, good in tokens, good in control. 
and maybe good in mid-range. Only a uh, deck I would say probably doesn't have a place for it is aggro. It might not be terrible in aggro, you know, cast it for four or five total mana, you get two or three guys, uh, life gain offsets a race. Maybe you're giving plus one to all your creatures. Anyway, probably not an aggro card, but could find homes in a variety of other decks, so I'm bringing it up here. Versus Silex. So, white mana activation, so this is a white card. It's legendary. And you wouldn't want multiples on the field anyway, because they would blow each other up. Uh, if you have six mana when you do this effect, you can pay to search up a Planeswalker, reveal it, put it in your hand, and shuffle. So, if you're like me, um, the way I built this account with jump in, starter decks, all of that, you might have a couple copies of the Wandering Emperor already. And it's one of the best cards in Standard. And Urza Silex fetches it up. And it's a sweeper. Urza Silex is probably more of a strict control card. Midrange often wants to populate the battlefield with enchantments and artifacts and uh, get value from a variety of different sources. A control deck, though, is often content to sweep the entire board. So this sort of shares company with Farewell. You can cast it in your turn cycles sooner than Farewell. Uh, this card is exposed, though, when you cast it on turn 3 to an artifact removal effect. And your opponent is clearly telegraphed that it's coming. But they might not be able to deal with it. If you're against a red aggro deck, they've already heavily committed to the board. Uh, the best they can do is to pressure you and then not commit more pieces to the board. So they have a turn cycle where they don't commit anything, you do this effectively, uh, depopulate, right? Four mana, blow up everything. You also sweep up things like Kumano faces Kakazan or uh, Mechanized Warfare if they've committed those to the board. Then they can rebuild, but they if they don't want to play into the Silex, they have to take a turn off. Which is good for you. I think this card has enough play patterns, enough uh, play to it. Plus, removing difficult permanents in the way that Farewell does, whereas this card's not going to uh, cycle out of the format very soon, for Farewell will cycle uh, out of standard in the fall. Rotate. Silex, I think, is a good pick. Lauren of the Third Path. So I remember a time in standard when uh, these effects were commonplace. You know, you had a creature ETB blow up an artifact or enchantment. It was all over the place. No one, you ran it if you wanted it. It was, you know, just a common thing you expected uh, to have access to in standard. And right now it's not quite as common. Titan of Industry does it, but that's seven mana. Or the, uh, you know, Cathar for two mana we talked about does it, but you have to sacrifice it. Lauren does this as an ETB trigger. And possibly if you flicker her, or she dies, you turn her from the graveyard, etc., she could do this multiple times. There are so many live targets of artifacts and enchantments to destroy in this format that I would say Lauren of the Third Path is nearly as good as a Necrotal or a Ravenous Chupacabra. Because people are just kind of ignoring artifact enchantment removal and everyone's playing it. It's just running rampant over the standard metagame. Uh, notably, one of the best cards in the format is uh, Kiki Jiki, right? The Mirror Breaker, that enchantment. Lauren of the Third Path almost entirely deals with that card potentially on curve. So they play the enchantment, they make the 2 2, 
Lauren comes down, blows up the enchantment, the 2-2 attacks, they get a treasure. Lauren blocks the 2-2, the 2-2 dies. Other than that treasure token, Lauren basically took care of the situation. Uh, commonly, your opponent will point removal at Lauren, but that also means you two for one to them, right? She entered the battlefield, blew something of theirs up, then she ate a removal spell. Lauren of the Third Path, I think, is one of the best white cards in standard right now. Not one of the most exciting, by any means, but I think she's one of the best. I think you should absolutely craft a copy of Lauren. All right. Restoration of Iganjo. Um, if you're like me, you might have a copy or two of this card in your collection. You could go up to four copies. It's good. It's very good. Um, taking advantage of the uh, two mana permanent on the second chapter. If you did the colorless crafting guide, you might already have um, Ecologist Terrarium. You might have some of the uh, two drops that we just talked about, like Ambitious Farmhand or uh, the doggy. <laughs> Those are also great with this card. And this card's not bad in an aggro deck either. It's a little slow for aggro, but you can cast a two mana threat for three on the second chapter. Finds you a planes, so you can keep getting into your upper threats like mural. Maybe you uh, go up to five mana on your threats in a slightly bigger aggro deck. And a 3-4 Vigilance that uh, makes a 1-1 one, one when it attacks or blocks. That's fabulous. That's um, almost as good as Adeline. Right? It has many of the same qualities that Adeline does. So, Restoration of Iganjo goes in a wide variety of decks. Great card. A little bit overshadowed by this other three-mana enchantment, Wedding Announcement. Uh, the moment I laid eyes on this card, I knew it was good. Um, some people hemmed and hawed when it was uh, first revealed. From the moment I looked at it, I said to myself, so it either draws you three cards and becomes a Glorious Anthem, or it makes three one ones and becomes a Glorious Anthem. Either of those is great. It's great. I think it was pretty obvious from the very beginning that uh, Wedding Announcement was a great card. And it still is. And people still use it. So you might uh, get some of these, but going up to four copies is not a bad idea. If that's what you want to do. Um, on an aside here, as far as four ofs, on a free-to-play account, on a budget, I really enjoy having a wide variety of threats in my deck. You protect yourself a little bit from uh, effects that root out and destroy multiple cards that have the same name. Um, you know, they're not, there's probably not many people running the Stone Brain, but the Stone Brain does it. There's a Demir legend, uh, Katose, the Silent Spider. She can do this as well. If you don't run four copies of a card in your deck, in fact, if you run a lot of one-ofs, you are very protected from this. The other thing you get with a lot of one-ofs is if one threat is not correct for the game or one answer is not correct for the game, well, at least you're not going to draw four copies of it because the shuffler is fine. Really and truly, having a bunch of one-ofs in your deck, it's fun. Try it out. Anyway, Adeline. Adeline is a legend. Whether you want multiples is up to you. Um, so being legendary is a drawback, but Adeline is such a powerful card, you might want more than one. She's just great. Incredibly powerful in an aggro deck. Not bad for any deck. You don't usually see Adeline in mid-range and control. But I don't see why you couldn't. Control usually can uh, do a bigger top-end creature, so they don't have to worry about the mana cost quite as much. 
That's the only reason I don't think you see um, Adeline in control decks as a finisher. She's fine. She can win the game on her own. She can do it. Having a one-off copy? Absolutely. As I said, great for aggro. Probably fine in other strategies, too. Depopulate. So if you want a control deck, that is what you want, then having at least one depopulate floating around somewhere in your list, uh, this is other than, you know, Urza Silex, Karn's Silex. Some of the only cheap board sweeper you can get that can hit creatures that are not tiny. All right, there's Malicious Malfunction in black that can give uh, minus two to all creatures and exile them. Which is great against aggro. Depopulate, though, is decently strong against other types of decks. Um, Midrange is good at rebuilding from board sweepers, but you still might like to have it. And Depopulate could also be good against ramp. And it's clearly good against aggro. Hitting it right at the 4 mana mark is what you want against aggro deck. So, crafting 1 um, helps you unlock the uh, control deck archetype. You could go in for multiples. It's a good card. Sarah Paragon. It's questionable if a deck wants 4 copies of Sarah Paragon, because there's only so much mana you have access to and only so many cards that have made their way into your graveyard. If you really leaned into it, you could probably take advantage of multiple Sarah Paragons. I have seen it happen. It's not impossible. But really what you want this card for is the one of. One copy of Sarah Paragon coming down and then sneaking a land drop out of your graveyard, sneaking a one drop out of your graveyard, or a two drop, or it comes down later in the game and you get a really nice card like Wedding Announcement or Restoration or Lauren or Adeline coming out of your graveyard. That's where Sarah Paragon really becomes backbreaking for the opponent. At that point, once you've played the Paragon, played a threat out of your graveyard, now they need another board sweeper. If they don't have another board sweeper at the very least, they probably need to point a removal spell at the Paragon, and the Paragon's already pulled another threat up out of your graveyard. Good for aggro, good for midrange. There's probably some kind of a weird ramp or control deck that if you if you have enough uh, things mana value three or less in the graveyard that you've uh, cobbled the deck around, I'm sure it would work there too. It'd be a little bit more weird, but Sarah Paragon, great card. Recommend crafting a copy. The Wandering Emperor, one of the best cards in standard. If you're like me, you might have a copy or two of her already. Going up to four, perfectly reasonable. Um, like all Planeswalkers, she's legendary. Um, she's terribly good, though. So, uh, you know, if you have more than one in your hand, play her as a removal spell at instant speed, use the minus two on your turn, use the minus one, ready to play it back. You have another Wandering Emperor in your hand. That is a totally legit way to play the Emperor. Uh, if you only have one or two copies, uh, she's a little bit more precious. Um, be a little bit more sparing. You know, try to keep her on the battlefield, use her plus one, even if you don't have a creature. It's just a great card. Because of the flash and the one-time instant speed activation. Phyrexian Vindicator. Uh, this card has not quite proved its metal yet in standard. It's new. Um, it's uncertain whether this card truly finds a home or not. Uh, this card did make it into a top 8 list recently. Uh, I looked at one of uh, 
Covert Go Blues videos. He didn't talk about this one, but I think I saw it lurking in the main deck or sideboard of one of the top eight decks he was looking at. So it did see real tournament play. So you could make a white-green Fight Club deck like the Phyrexian Obliterator. I think the Vindicator doesn't have as much uh, immediate crushing uh, despair of losing all the permanents on your board state like the Obliterator does. Unlike the Obliterator, this can fight with anything and the damage is prevented so the Vindicator survives the fight. Survives the fight with Death Touch survives the fight with anything. The damage is prevented. So even though its uh, impact is not as overwhelming, um, it stays on the board. And maybe people are not seeing this potential in this card. If you have a white deck that likes to go big, you know, maybe you... Uh, Drop an ambitious farm hand, uh, get your white mana going, you're playing lay down arms, you're stalling the opponent, you get this down on turn four. The aggro deck, if, if you've stalled correctly, if you've preserved your life total enough, the aggro deck cannot get through this card. And if they attack into it with a wide board, this will kill the thing that hit it. It will kill another one of their things, and unless they put you to a very low life total, um, completely turns around the game in the span of a single attack cycle. If you were able to give this card Vigilance, I'm pretty sure it would just win the game on its own. So maybe you could think about pairing this card with um, uh, Elspeth, the one from uh, Streets of New Capenna. I didn't put her on this list because I... A, you might get a copy or two of her. I do. I have a couple copies of her. And B, um, I'm not quite sure if Elspeth is as much of a slam dunk. But Elspeth would be a back-breaking follow-up to uh, a stabilized board with this Vindicator. Give it a plus one counter. Give it Vigilance. And then after that, you give it lifelink, and then it's a 7-7, seven, seven, and, you know, <laughs> that's game. So I will not absolutely tell you to craft this card. Four white mana is a heck of a commitment. I think it's um, good, though. I think it can have a home in standard. It has already seen some tournament play, so be aware of it. By invitation only, this is the um, sweeper that no one runs, and I don't know why. So the funny thing about by invitation only is you get to pick the number. And if you pick the number, uh, let's say you've gone wider than the opponent, right? You can have a control or mid-range deck, or a ramp deck, or whatever, <laughs> and you can be playing creatures, and uh, by invitation only, you know, if you're in a board state where you need to blow up all of your creatures, that's fine. You know when you need to do that, and the opponent's board must be dealt with, but uh, you could also be in a situation where you name three, the opponent has three creatures, you have five. Now they've lost everything, you still have your two best creatures. Sacrifice, uh, you know, not only does it not target, it also does not care about indestructible. It, by invitation only, I have often found this sweeper to be, in many cases, better than depopulate. And it should be, it's a mana more than Depopulate does. Uh, I think maybe one time the entire time I've been playing this card, I think there was maybe one game where naming 13 was not enough. The opponent had gone so wide. So, one game out of hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, um, seems fine. 
It seems like that situation um, basically never comes up. This card is good. It deals with the board more thoroughly than Depopulate does. Sometimes you want to depopulate on four, though. Sometimes the extra mana is a problem. So, if you're thinking about uh, running, you know, two copies of depopulate, maybe you craft one depopulate, you craft one by invitation only. They're going to rotate at the same time in the fall. So it's the same for your wild cards either way. Consider it. Steel Seraph. If you're familiar at all with Standard, you probably know this card is good. Very good. Playing it as a 3-3-4-3, three, 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 that can, uh, starting that turn, give uh, another one of your creatures flying to get through, Vigilance um, to keep up the threat of blocking, Lifelink to win a race, then the next turn it can start giving itself these things, already has flying, as a 3-3 artifact creature for 3, um, it's not hit by cut down or go for the throat. In black, you basically need Infernal Grasp, or you know, a 3 mana or larger removal spell, which is not ideal. Then there's the whole aspect of, um, you know, it could be a 5-4 for 6. So, late game, Late game top deck, you know, a 3-3 with these abilities probably would have been fine. But now you have the option to cast it as a 5-4 for 6 in the late game. This card is great. Absolutely great. Can go into aggro because of being 3 mana. It's just fine in aggro. There will be occasions where you cast it for 6 mana in aggro. Doesn't come up very often, but it can. The lifelink is very relevant for winning races against other aggro decks. It's good. Midrange. This is the stuff that midrange is made of. Right here. This card. This right here is what midrange is made of. Stuff like Steel Seraph. Cards that are good in a variety of game states. Uh, that can win the game on their own, that make your other creatures better, provide value in different ways, uh, has modality. And in control, or ramp, um, you can do better. You can do better. I didn't uh, put it on this list. There's um, a Mythic Angel for six that I might say that in ramp or control is a better card than Steel Seraph but it's not bad. And you could play it for three if you needed to. Right? If you don't have the right answer, need to, uh, need to stall, need to get some life gain to offset what the opponent's doing. Even in a control or ramp deck, both aspects of this card can be put to use. And uh, kind of like having a copy of Elspeth, having a copy of this in your ramp deck, it's just great to give some giant creature like Titan of Industry lifelink. That's amazing. Especially because it has trample. That means even uh, if they chump block and sacrifice because of the trample, it's still going to connect. You're still going to gain the life. Still Seraph's a good card. Farewell. Well, is pretty much strictly for control. Uh, you'd be quite a weirdo rather <laughs> than farewell in an aggro or mid range pile. I probably shouldn't be there. Farewell is such a strong card for control that I'm going to mention it here. Now, being six mana, sometimes it's too slow, sometimes it uh, doesn't arrive soon enough. You might want to create treasure tokens or ramp to it, right? If you have green-white, and green-white control again. Probably one of the only people who does it. It's great, though. Yeah, you can ramp up to Farewell to cast it sooner than turn six. 
Um, it's also hard to make sure you hit every land drop up to six. Control decks and ramp decks, they can do this sort of thing. They can ensure that they can get there. And the effect is so powerful, including hitting graveyards, that uh, with the one Achilles heel, the Achilles heel of this card that you should be aware of is Planeswalkers. So if you really like Farewell, if this is your sweeper of choice, you just say, I want to get rid of everything. I want to remove their artifacts, I want to remove their enchantments, I want to remove their graveyard, I want to deal with everything. The Achilles heel is Planeswalkers. And Fateful Absence makes a great pair in a deck that has Farewell. You'll probably use it as cheap removal uh, leading up to the turns where you cast Farewell because you need to buy time to get to your Farewell. Um, however, after a Farewell um, as a top deck or just, you know, just later in the game, Fateful Absence deals with Planeswalkers. In a Control Mirror, it's not great to give the opponent a clue, but it is great to uh, at least threaten to kill their Planeswalker at instant speed. Uh, a lot of other cards I could have talked about that are decent removal spells don't hit Planeswalkers. This is why Fateful Absence is in the list. So, Farewell, it's good. As a 6-drop, probably don't want 4 of them. Uh, craft 1 or 2 if, this, if you know you want this for your control deck. It's very powerful. Um, often, when you resolve this, if the opponent doesn't have a good follow-up to rebuild, they'll just scoop. Green-white uh, enchantment deck and uh, black-red Rakdos deck with the anvil. Those are both decks that have terrible, terrible losses to this card. The Eternal Wanderer. Uh, Covert Go Blue just mentioned in his uh, talk about tournament deck lists that the Eternal Wanderer was one of the cards that showed up the most, which is really surprising because it's six mana and a Planeswalker. So not only is this a sweeper, right, this is another sweeper you can take for your control deck. With the minus four, you get to choose the creature that each player keeps. So you could say, I keep my Steel Seraph, and in your black deck you keep your uh, Tenacious Underdog. Let's go. <laughs> the zero, putting out two two double strikers. Double strike is uh, terrifying. Double strike is such a scary ability. Um, growing the creature even a little bit has twice as much effect. And the plus one, not only can you uh, you know, kind of do a Yorian impression where you're blinking your things and uh, re-triggering the Enter the Battlefield effects. So, you know, cards like Lauren. Uh, blink your Lauren out, comes back at the end step, blows up another artifact or enchantment. That's good. Good play. You also will very often keep the opponent on the back foot by uh, keeping one of their permanents exiled and coming back at the end of their turn to where it can't attack you. It doesn't come back until the beginning of that player's next end step. So you could stall their card forever by blessing the Eternal Wanderer. The card is good. All the modes are unlocked as soon as it hits the battlefield. The tournament players have seen its potential. They're using it. It's seeing play at the highest levels of competition in top eights. Sounds good recommend crafting it. All right, so I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I have opened a couple more boosters. I have eight rare wild cards and six mythics. So I need to talk about all of the monocolors and I still need to get to multicolor. So my plan right now is I'm going to spend one rare 
each on each of the mono colors, and one mythic on each of the mono colors. And when I get to uh, multicolor, I might spend two or three rares and my last mythic. Because I want to show you that I have this conviction. That uh, it's not just all words. So if I can only spend one rare and one mythic here, in this moment. My one rare, I want to be Lauren of the Third Path. I think it's value proposition, it's spot on the mana curve, it's ability to, you know, take something out and then still trade with an opponent's creature. It has two power. It's probably sufficient against aggro. It's so, so good. It's so well positioned in this place in standard that even if it didn't have vigilance and even if it didn't have tap you and the target opponent each draw a card, if it didn't have those abilities, I would still say this effect is fabulous and you need it. You need it in your deck. I know I do. All right. Lauren of the Third Path, I am crafting you. I think you are the best choice of rear. I'm even choosing you above the new Wandering Emperor. My conviction is this high for Lauren of the Third Path. If it wasn't legendary, I might very well recommend crafting more than one. I like to just recommend crafting one legendary, though. Respect the fact that legendary is a drawback. All right. One mythic. Most of these cards on this list are rares. And that's kind of what you run into with your wild cards. Um, you get even more bottlenecked on rares than mythics. You want more of the rare cards and their effects than you do of the mythic cards and their effects. So even though mythics are the most rare, they are harder to get than rares. It's harder to complete your set of mythics. You don't get as many mythic wild cards. You'll find yourself using more of your rare wild cards than your mythic wild cards. It's a conundrum. Also, uh, uncommons are more common than commons. It's weird. Anyway, I think they should hand out more common wild cards. Okay, right, let's look at the mythics that I've chosen to talk about here. We've got Urza's Silex. Right, sweeper that's going to uh, stay post-rotation in the fall. Definitely like it. Has uh, things in common with Farewell. Phyrexian Vindicator. Probably not going to pick this one. I'm a little bit less certain of where this card fits into the standard metagame. So I'm not going to recommend it yet. I think it's got the chops, though. I think, in some ways, it's better than Phyrexian Obliterator. Maybe people should be trying it for their Fight Club decks. Sarah Paragon. Just an incredible piece of value proposition and threatening the opponent. Um, as a one of such a fabulous card. Wandering Emperor, since I already have a couple of these, I'm not going to uh, craft more. I believe I have two copies. Yeah, I've got two copies of the Wandering Emperor. So, it's great. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad choice. Um, I like variety. I'm not going to use it here uh, as my mythic. Okay. So I think I'm between Sarah Paragon and Urza's Silex. There are other ways to build mid-range decks um, and aggro decks and such. There are other ways to get that value proposition. There are lots of good uncommons that exist out there in the wilds that can threaten the opponent, get you value, create a a tough board state for the opponent to deal with. I think there are other ways to do it. 
there are not many ways to build a control deck. If you don't have the sweepers, if you don't have a way to stay at parity or have a catch-up mechanism with the opponent, then you can't make a control deck archetype. This is a very close call here between Sarah Paragon and Urza Silex, but I'm going to go for Silex. Alright, Mythic Wildcard spent. So, I hope you've enjoyed this chat about um, the toolbox of white cards that I recommend. I'll try to uh, keep spending my own wild cards at about the same pace as we go through the other four colors and then multicolored. Liking my video and subscribing to my channel helps me out a great deal as a YouTuber, but don't do it for that reason. Like and subscribe if I have given you value and you have enjoyed my content. So, until next time, stay cool.